This month on the Taboo Topics podcast. I've had women come to me and say they just want their life back and they never realized how good they had it before going through this period of time. Welcome to Taboo Topics, where host Mary Frances Emmons tackles awkward medical questions with Orlando Health's top health and wellness experts, getting the answers you've been searching the internet to find. Submit your own questions by emailing the letter r-podcast at orlandohealth.com or leave a five-star rating with your question in the review section. This podcast is produced and sponsored by the healthcare leaders at Orlando Health. Hello, and welcome to Taboo Topics, where we try to take the stigma out of embarrassing personal health questions. I'm Mary Frances Emmons, your host, and today we're talking about what women really need to know about menopause. My guest is Dr. Christine Greaves, a board-certified OBGYN with Orlando Health Women's Institute. Welcome to Taboo Topics, Dr. Greaves. Thank you for having me. So first, tell us a little bit about your work at Orlando Health and why this topic is so important. Absolutely. My work at Orlando Health involves being an obstetrician gynecologist. That means I work with women. I work with women in all different aspects of their health journey, basically, from the moment that they start a period sometimes to um, their childbirth to afterwards when they are in menopause. And the journey includes positives and negatives. It includes having illnesses and help. And so that's that's what I do every day. So what is perimenopause and what are the first signs that you might be in it? So perimenopause occurs when your ovaries gradually stop working, when they don't work like they worked before you entered that period in your life. The average age of when perimenopause occurs in a woman is 47 years old. Of course, it's average, so it can be before, it can be after. Um, that is also the time, not only of when the ovaries start decreasing what they're normally doing, but it also manifests in different ways in people. Because if the ovaries aren't working as well, that means the hormones are less. So less estrogen, less progesterone. Therefore, you might see you know, hot flashes start to occur. You may have vaginal dryness. There may be some changes in muscle mass, fatigue, um, things of that nature, and dryness even in your skin, hair thinning. Those are all some ways that uh, these changes can manifest and start that process, that journey of when you're no longer going to be menstruating every month, meaning that you've released an egg, to the menopausal time period where you're no longer releasing an egg every month and no longer making those hormones of estrogen and progesterone. So the emotional effects of menopause sometimes get more attention, but mm -hmm. you mentioned physical effects also like the loss of muscle mass, you can have mm -hmm. skyrocketing cholesterol, a perceived inability to lose weight. Can you speak a little bit more about those physical changes and how to handle them. Yes, absolutely. So, and it's it's not, it may not just be because the estrogen that's decreased means that's how things are manifested. It can be because there are what we call confounding variables. For example, if you're exhausted because you're having hot flashes all night, so you're not sleeping well, that may result in you're not wanting to exercise the next day. You're too tired. You may notice also a change if you're not exercising, a change of where your fat goes, where meaning if we eat more than we burn, our body places our fat more centrally. Um, and when body fat is placed more centrally, that can result in um, increased heart disease. And so when that occurs, we may feel like it's harder to lose weight. Also, if you are not exercising regularly, lifting weights or with resistance training, then that means that you're not supporting your muscle mass. You may actually be losing muscle mass because also your testosterone value goes down. And that is helpful 
for maintaining muscle mass, but also if you're not using your muscles, similar to even in children, if you have your arm in a cast or your leg in a cast, you notice there's atrophy of the muscles. Muscles are very helpful at burning more calories than fat. So that's why it may seem like it's harder to lose weight and you may notice physical changes. Um, Another physical change that people notice is vaginal dryness or their vaginal walls may be thinner. And that's also because of the decrease in estrogen. And so those are some of the physical changes and a way to handle that, the, the vaginal dryness or vaginal, you know, and the vaginal thinning is um, when you notice it, make sure you mention it to your doctor. So that way we can try to help you and give you tips specifically pertaining to you. But if you start noticing it originally, like with intercourse, for example, you feel more dry and you don't know why, recognize that that's part of your journey, but you, you need to try to help your body out a little bit and get some lubrication, a non-irritating lubrication, and it doesn't have to be hormonal. For example, you can just get, you know, a water-based, silicone-based, and um, just something that's not irritating. I don't recommend that someone start out with trying lubricants with flavors or warming materials because that can result in... Um, you know, irritation per se, when your tissue is thinner. Um, I also recommend cooking oil, believe it or not, or coconut oil. That's nice and smooth. That's good for when you're in a monogamous relationship because um, that can affect the integrity of a condom, for example. So just process, you know, what is your sexual health like and, and and do you need to protect from infections or you were in a situation where it doesn't matter. So you mentioned the vaginal dryness mm-hmm. um, and I understand that menopause can affect both um, the sex drive as well as your experience of sex. So mm-hmm. what do women and their partners for those who have a partner need to know about that? Mm-hmm. More than a third of women report difficulties with sex during this perimenopausal and menopausal period of time. So That's an excellent question. And behind closed doors at visits, we definitely talk about this. So thank you for asking this. Um, So it can affect the sex drive for a few reasons. Yes, our hormones change. Okay. So for example, there could be a physical component um, with regards to, you know, simply discomfort, right? And I have many women who come and say, you know, we're having sex just once a week, once a month, and it hurts. I really don't enjoy it anymore. And that can be because of what we just talked about, the the process of less estrogen causing the vaginal atrophy and dryness. Um, That's one physical manifestation. Also testosterone, our testosterone value goes down and that can also affect sex drive. It's also important to realize that in women, our number one sex organ is our brain. And if we're feeling tired, if we don't feel attracted by our partner, if we feel like, oh no, I'm going to have pain. And if we don't feel like we have someone helping us with this journey, then naturally the sex drive may go down a little bit. And also what is your relationship like? We talk about love languages as well. That's why, um, It's important to have a healthcare provider that you feel comfortable with divulging um, what you think the concern is so we can help with that component. More on this after the break. This episode is brought to you by the healthcare leaders at Orlando Health, where we deliver the future of medicine today. Orlando Health, choose well. So you mentioned something else that I had not heard before that uh, the size of the opening to the vagina also can change Mm -hmm. during menopause, but is that uh, a physical change driven by menopause or is it more that because of the factors you just described that it's uncomfortable, you don't want to do it, and therefore you that change in size is maybe lack of use? Mm, Great question. Yeah. If you don't use your vagina before, 
before menopause occurs or the perimenopause occurs, you have the hormones, meaning the estrogen that is keeping your vagina patent, keeping it open. Okay. But once you hit the period of time where the estrogen isn't necessarily there, keeping it open without any penetration by either a toy or a penis, then that can, that combination of lack of mechanical um, opening in addition to the lack of hormones can contribute to the vagina getting smaller to that statement that we have commonly heard of. If you don't use it, you lose it. So there's been a tremendous amount in the media in the last 20 years about the dangers of hormone therapy that mm-hmm. women often uh, received uh, for symptoms of menopause. What is hormone therapy and what's the latest thinking there? Yeah. So hormone therapy is basically a medication that will give you the female hormones of estrogen and or progesterone um, and or testosterone. The um, the but that is considered hormone therapy. And yes, there are dangers. Everything in life has a risk benefits and alternatives, even when you drive in a car, you know. Um, so it's important to recognize that um in this situation, yes, there are dangers of it. Um, it does not mean that everyone's going to get it, which is why it's important to, you know, be in touch with your healthcare provider. But there are risk of you know, cancer, stroke, blood clots. When I say that, that does sound super scary, but it depends, right? Is it scarier having hot flashes, not sleeping, not being able to drive your car and function at work, et cetera, the next day, not making um, good decisions, being sad, miserable. I've had women come to me and say they just want their life back and they never realized how good they had it before going through this period of time. Now, that doesn't mean that Everyone who undergoes perimenopause, menopause is going to have a horrible time by any means. But it's important to recognize that if you're in a situation of where you're not feeling great and and you need help, speak up and we can we can talk about it. And there are non-hormonal strategies that we can address to alleviate those symptoms first before considering hormones if you don't have a contraindication. When I have patients who want to go on hormones, we usually try the non-hormonal methods first. And if that doesn't work, then we go over the risk. And a lot of times people, actually the majority of times, people are just so much happier to feel more like themselves. So. Um, I'm a proponent for what gives people the best quality of life as long as with no judgment, as long as it's not going to harm them. So there are a lot of supplements on the market mm-hmm. that claim to help with symptoms. I don't know if that might be some of the non-hormonal methods you would refer to, but are any of those effective? Are they safe to try? It depends on one's history, right? Like if you have a history of breast cancer, I would be very careful to in trying the plant-based estrogen. I wouldn't do that. I would make sure I talked with my oncologist to see if the particular breast cancer had a estrogen receptor or progesterone receptor, things like that. So, but in general, um, something like black cohosh is very well studied um, and has been shown that it can, it doesn't always, but it can help with the hot flashes um, a little bit more than the placebo. Now, some studies have shown that, some have not. Um, But again, it's important before talking, before considering this to make sure you talk about it with your healthcare provider because you certainly shouldn't even consider that if you have liver problems. You know, some studies say flaxseed helps um, and, um, you know, You'll hear about red clover. It's not proven. There are companies out, you know, even with wild yam that are um, showing that that may help. And the thing to keep in mind about the over-counter supplements and even the bioidentical hormones is that those are not necessarily FDA regulated. So, 
you don't necessarily know that the black cohosh you got two months ago is going to be the same as a black cohosh you're going to get, you know, the, the subsequent months. So that is something to keep in mind. And whereas if you were to get the prescription of the hormones, then the amount of estrogen in an estrogen patch, an estrogen pill or the cream um, that you're given or whatever modality um, is going to be the same because it's FDA regulated. So menopause is typically thought of as a pretty long transition. But what about someone who has a hysterectomy? Do you just kind of get slammed into it? Mm, good question. So it hysterectomies, there are many different types of hysterectomies, right? But hysterectomy means taking out the uterus. So, but a lot of times when we talk about a hysterectomy, we don't know if the ovaries are taken or not. So it all depends on whether the ovaries are taken or not. We try to, as long as the ovaries look good, and if it's just, you know, if she's having a hysterectomy for benign reasons, meaning not cancerous reasons, then we try to leave the ovaries because of the benefits that it provides. And especially if someone is in her 30s or 40s, um, obviously the 20s, we try to leave the ovaries. Um, there are certain conditions where the ovaries do need to be removed. If the ovaries are removed, both ovaries are removed at the time of a hysterectomy, then yes, it is a, it is surgical menopause. If one ovary is remaining, then no. If just the uterus is removed and the ovaries are remaining, then no, it does not throw someone into menopause. It may make it, um, more difficult to know when you are going through menopause because you no longer have your period that's becoming irregular as a good gauge. Um, however, hot flashes usually make themselves known to people. So you can have your warning in that regard. <laughs> so just so we end on a happier note, yeah. uh, many women do uh, describe life as better after menopause. And I wondered what are the, some of the upsides that your patients describe? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Well, some of the upsides to menopause, one, one is you don't have your monthly friend visiting you each month, meaning you're not worried about, um, your period coming. Um, because not every woman feels great during her period. You or not coming. A right, different right. reason to worry. Yes, that is definitely the case. Yes, especially with, you know, 50% unintended pregnancy rate. You don't have to worry about that. So that, that is an upside. Well, is there anything else you would want listeners to know about this topic? Mm -hmm. I would want listeners to know that um, becoming perimenopausal and menopausal is part of our natural journey as a woman. And it's that alone is natural and recognize that sometimes things that occur are difficult. And that is why we are here to help. And um, if you notice that it's a difficult transition, or even if it's not, and you need to talk about it, like that's what we're here for. Just make sure, you know, to contact your healthcare provider and we'd love to hold your hand. Um, figuratively throughout this whole process. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Greaves, for helping us better understand this taboo topic. You can learn more about Dr. Greaves and her work at orlandohealth.com. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Taboo Topics. If you enjoyed this episode, please show your support by sharing with a friend and leaving us a five-star review. Subscribe today to be sure you never miss an episode. This show is produced and sponsored by the healthcare leaders at Orlando Health. To find a doctor, walk-in clinic, or emergency room near you, visit orlandohealth.com.